Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee to give me the opportunity uh, to address the question of the assessment and prevention of uh, osteoporosis in early postmenopausal women. So this is my disclosure. So you all know that osteoporosis and osteoporotic related fracture are a major health issue in postmenopausal women. And at the age of 50, the lifetime risk of having a fracture is about 40%, which that means that one woman out of three or out of four will experience a fracture before the end of her life. And it has to be compared to the lifetime risk of dying from a cardiovascular disease, which is about 50%. But more importantly, the lifetime risk of having a breast cancer, which is far less, around 9%. And as it has been shown, the increase in the rate of fracture in postmenopausal women is partly or maybe mostly due to what happened to at the menopause because the bone tissue is a very sensitive tissue to estrogen deficiency. And you have shown that you have this acceleration of bone loss within the first years of menopause. And this, uh, this slide highlights what we call the sexual dimorphism of the skeletal, which explains why the fracture rate is much higher in women than in men. Therefore, it is appropriate, I mean, is it necessary to provide uh, appropriate guidance for early postmenopausal women uh, to prevent osteoporosis? But several issues need to be addressed because evaluating the risk of fracture in early postmenopausal women is going to be very different from what you have learned in the evaluation of the risk of fracture in older women. First of all, the 10 year risk of fracture is usually moderate, is about one half to that in the age range of 60 to 69. Although considerable cost and a loss of quality adjusted life years are still incurred in this age group, that's why we have to care about evaluating the, uh, this risk of fracture. Secondly, the distribution of fracture is very different from what is observed in older women. And you you'll see later on that most fracture occur in osteopenic women, but nevertheless, these osteopenic women represent about 50% of the women who start menopause. So this, this slide shows you the incidence of fracture with aging, and it's very easy to see that the uh, rate of fracture really increase after the age of 65, and especially with regard to hip fracture after the age of 70 at 75. So within the first 10 years of menopause, again, the rate of fracture is quite moderate. And the, uh, th the second thing, which is very important, this is the distribution of osteoporotic fracture. So you can see that within the first 10 years after menopause, the most frequent fracture are wrist fracture or ankle fracture or rib fracture. It's not hip fracture. The hip fracture again increase with age and it represents uh, the major fracture, especially after the age of 70 and even after the age of 80. And it, it has been shown also in this prospective study which has been performed in Finland. So this study is very interesting because they have followed a large group of early postmenopausal women and you can see that the, the fracture which were observed within this follow-up period were mainly again wrist, ankle or rib fracture, while the major osteoporotic fracture were less uh, frequent at that age. But again, and this is my third message, most of this fracture occurs in osteopenic women. So you can see on this slide that there is an increase in the rate of fracture with a decrease in T-score. But you can see if you look to the number of fracture which occur in within 10 years after menopause, you can see that the number is not low and that most of the fracture occur in, occur in women who have osteopenia. And that's what we have shown in, our, in a study which was performed in my clinic. This is a MENO study. This study was a prospective study over um, a period of time of more than 10 years. So th uh, we include a large group of women, uh, more than 2,600 women. And when you, uh, when you rely the uh, fracture which were observed during this follow-up with the baseline T-score, you can see that 50% of the fracture occurs or or in women who had 
osteopenia at baseline at entry in the study. So basically, we have two distinct situations at the beginning of menopause. We have, of course, women who start menopause with a very high risk of fractures because they have already a history of major fragility fracture, they have secondary osteoporosis, or they have very low uh, T-score because of genetic reason, because of a uh, familiar uh, predisposition to osteoporosis. Fortunately, the prevalence of these women are quite uh, low. And in fact, we have to face most women with a moderate risk of fracture. And all the challenge will be among those women to identify those who will, who will fracture within the next 10 years. And it's not so easy. I'm going to try to show you. So we have the usual tools. You know these tools that have been used in the evaluation in the risk of fracture, the clinical risk factor, age, personal history of fracture, and so on and so on. The bone density rheumatry, it, it is a cornerstone of the evaluation of the risk of fracture. And again, we, we also have some markers, some biochemical, biochemical markers, especially those uh, which reflect bone reception, which can be also used in, 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 this, uh, in this evaluation. But at the beginning of menopause, there are very few studies which have uh, evaluated the predictive value of these different tools to, uh, with regard to fractures. Uh, basically, there's only two prospective studies, the DOP study, which was performed uh, in, in Denmark, and the MENO study, which was performed in my group. So these two studies have included w women at the beginning of menopause. You can see that the average age was around 51 in the DOP study and 54 in our study. There were normal women at baseline. You see the T-score was normal. It was a little bit um, lower in our study because they were a little bit, oh, sorry, um, older. But basically, it was healthy early postmenopausal women. So this slide show you the incidence of major osteoporotic fracture, which was observed within these 10 years of, of follow-up. So again, you see that the most common fracture were wrist fractures, and we had about the same incidence of major osteoporotic fracture in these two studies which was about 9% over the 10 years uh, follow-up period. And then when you examine the uh, predictors of this major osteoporotic fracture, as it was done, for instance, in the MENA study, so you find again the, the factor you are used uh, I mean, which have been I'm sorry, which have been validated um, as a good predictor uh, factors. So the decrease in BMD was associated with an increased risk of major osteoporotic fracture. A prior history of fracture was also associated with uh, the risk of, of subsequent fracture. But more interestingly, the FRAX model, uh, which has been widely uh, use in older women to predict the risk of fracture is as very low value to predict this risk of fracture in early postmenopausal women. And it, it is shown in this part of the figure when you evaluate uh, the uh, rock by, by the rock analysis uh, method, the value of the FRAX over the single measurement of hip fracture, of, I'm sorry, of hip BMD. In fact, the FRAX model does, uh, does not add anything to uh, uh, predict the risk of fracture as compared to a single measurement at the hip level. And it was also shown in the DOP study, when you calculate uh, the, uh, through with the uh, FRAX model, the number of fractures which should have been observed within the, the 10 year follow up, in fact, the prediction, uh, the, predic the, the, the number uh, which were predicted by the FRAX model was much less than the number of fractures which was observed in, in, this, in this study. Don't, uh, thus, again, the FRAX model is not of very, I mean, it's not of high value in these uh, early postmenopausal women. And in fact, 
the value of bone mineral density at the beginning of menopause is probably the tool, even though its sensitivity is not perfect, it's far for to be perfect, but still it is right now the best tool to evaluate the risk of fracture. And especially this, this slide show you that the predictive value of BMD uh, is better uh, in, in younger women, of course, because with aging, you have other factors which will influence the risk of, factor of fracture, such as falls, for instance instance. And finally, the biochemical markers might also uh, uh, of, of value to evaluating the risk of fracture in uh, early postmenopausal uh, women. And I, I, I show this, this study, which, which is again a, a French study, which was performed in Lyon, the Ophélie study, and at that time they didn't have the new biochemical markers such as CTX, so they were using the bone alkaline phosphatase, but still you can see that in those women with uh, a, a nostopenic uh, BMD, adding the, the phosphatase alkaline, if you take the uh, highest quartile of uh, bone alkaline phosphatase uh, values, uh, you increase the sensitivity of the model. And basically, uh, a, a woman who has osteopenia plus a high um, level of bone alkaline phosphatase has the same risk to, uh, f to have a fracture than women who have osteoporosis. So, I'm sorry, oops. So in the, ooh. okay, here we are. So in summary, the identification of uh, uh, early postmenopausal at high risk of fracture is not uh, easy. It remains difficult, but from our own experience and from the data of the literature, we can identify three major risk factors, a low vertebral T-score, whether it is a threshold, a T-score of minus, minus two, it remains to be uh, validated. A uh, history of prior fragility fracture is also very important to identify those women who will fracture within the next 10 years. And also uh, the high bone turnover level, and especially if you have a CTX level or NTX uh, level, which is uh, higher than the premenopausal range, you can use this, this, this marker to uh, identify those women who will be at risk of fracture. Then I would like to turn on to the uh, treatment option that you can use in those women at moderate risk at the beginning of menopause. And in fact, the only two agents that should be used in early postmenopausal women should be either estrogen or SERMs. I mean, there's the debate, it's completely over. I mean, the estrogen therapy is the most efficient tool to prevent osteoporosis, uh, to prevent postmenopausal bone loss and osteoporotic fracture. It prevents estrogen deficiency related bone loss. It prevents the damage in the microarchitecture which occur at the beginning of menopause and especially at the level of the trabecular bone, the bone which is at the, at the, at the, in the wrist or in the vertebrae or in the ribs. It also decreases the risk of fracture, whatever the bone side, whatever the age of the women, and whatever the level of risk of fracture. I want to remind you that estrogen therapy is the only therapy which have proven its efficacy in even low risk women or mo moderate risk women. And it has been shown in the WHI uh, study. So you can see that uh, the, if the anti fracture efficacy of uh, uh, estrogen is not low because you can prevent around 50, I'm sorry, 50 fracture per 10,000 women every year, so it's not low, again. And, and also, in early postmenopausal women, the prevention of osteoporosis is the main challenge, but you have to remind that the global healthcare is also important, and with hormone therapy, you'll be able to correct the climacteric symptoms to prevent uh, genitory uh, sexual um, uh, syndrome of menopause, and also uh, you you have we, we have right now more and more data which demonstrate that estrogen will have a, benef a beneficial effect in the prevention of atherosclerosis development, and it was highlighted in the last a consensus statement of hormone therapy where it was clearly stated that benefits are more likely to outweigh risk when 
treatment is initiated in symptomatic women before the age of 60, and that hormone therapy is the only therapy available with randomized control uh, trials proven efficacy of fracture reduction. If the woman cannot take estrogen because of vascular reason, or if she, if she doesn't want to take estrogen, some might be a, an alternative to MHD at that age because of this agonistic effect on bone and because of this antagonist effect on the uterus and breast. So in summary, the challenge, it's not only to uh, identify those women who will have a high risk of fracture within the first 10 years of menopause, but to provide her an uh, efficient tool to diminish the bone, uh, the bone, um, uh, postmenopausal bone loss. So hormone therapy in symptomatic women, raloxifen might be an alternative option, especially in asymptomatic women at risk of for spine fracture, and especially if there are concerns about breast cancer risk. TSEC also is a new tool which could be used in, in this aspect, even though we don't have any fracture data, but it works well to prevent postmenopausal post uh, bone loss, similarly uh, as uh, hormone therapy or raloxifen, so you can use. And also, when you want to prevent postmenopausal bone loss or to give an efficient therapy to early postmenopausal women for the prevention of osteoporosis, you have to keep in mind that osteoporosis cannot be cured to date. So you have to have a strategy, a global strategy, uh, what I would call a sequential approach to osteoporosis, which would consist to give uh, hormone therapy <laughs> within the first years of menopause, because it is at this age that the therapy is not only the most efficient, but probably the safest because of uh, the benefits of hormone therapy on the climateric symptoms and the increase in the breast cancer risk, which on we, um, uh, will only on occur after several years of therapy, and after, let's say, five to seven years of hormone therapy, if you think that it might increase the risk of breast cancer, or if you, ha if you think that the um, risk-benefit balance is not as good as uh, at the beginning of menopause, then in those women who are still at high risk for, uh, for fractures, you can switch from uh, hormone therapy to raloxifen, because at around the age of 60, usually a lot of women do, uh, do not have uh, symptoms anymore, and it is the age where the breast cancer risk is the highest, so it could be interesting to switch from hormone therapy at that age to raloxifen, and after five to 10 years of therapy, if, if your woman is still at high risk for fracture, then you can uh, and you, you can use either bifosinate or denosumab, or I would say the true osteoporotic uh, drugs. And s s the, of course, this is quite of a theoretical model. This model was never validated, so I'm not able to tell you whether this model will really decrease the risk and the burden of osteoporotic fracture. But I, I think it's, it is really logical to use the agents which uh, first of all, decrease postmenopausal bone loss at a period where the risk of fracture is not it's moderate, it's not very high, and then to keep the very efficient drugs which have proven their efficacy to uh, significantly reduce the reduce, uh, risk of hip fracture in very high risk women. On not on, I mean, not only because they have a clinical risk factor or low bone mineral density, but because they are older. Don't forget that the age is a major determinant of the risk of fracture. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> I just want to extend a word of thank you to the organizing committee for asking me to address you on the non-hormonal treatment of, of osteoporosis, not only the present, but also the future. I also want to tell you that I've got a tie, just like our chairman is wearing in my pocket here, but the people for the Melbourne Congress took it off and gave me a koala <laughs> instead to wear so that you can just know about the 2020 Congress in, in Melbourne. Um, can I just, is this here? So <coughs> these are my disclosures. Now I would, uh, any topic or any talk on treatment must first start by stating that you never 
do any therapy before doing the basics. And that has been adequately highlighted here. The diet and the lifestyle modifications, I'd just like to add one thing there, and <coughs> that is the fact that also have a look at the protein content of the diet. Bone doesn't only consist of the minerals, it also consists of a, a matrix of protein. So the next um, aspect which I'd just like to briefly touch on is who do we treat? Who's the target of treatment? And uh, I think Florence adequately uh, showed you, especially in, in the younger patient, at the present moment, we have two views on the aspect. The American College of Physicians recently came out with a statement just stating bluntly that you should treat any patient with a T-score of minus 2.5, irrespective of any risk factors. I don't think the rest of the world or America actually agrees with that. I think we all look at a more balanced approach of balancing um, the factors of the, all the risk factors, the age, et cetera, in a model such as FRAX. And the point is just when to treat according to the fracture risk. Um, but it looks like a com either a uh, risk of a hip fracture of 5% over the next 10 years or 15% of a major fracture would be an indication for treatment. But as it was um, shown in the previous um, <coughs> by the previous speaker, that's not really valid for the younger patient and more for the older patient. Okay, so now we've decided to treat and um, we are not going to touch on, on the hormones or the hormone-related ones. We're going to look at the non-hormonal drugs. So it's always a good time to just reflect on bone remodeling as that is the basis of everything with osteoporosis. And we start off with the normal bone which is then followed by activation of the osteoclast. They dig a hole in the bone, remove the old bone, which is then filled again by the osteoblast so that you have a new skeletal structure. And the balance between the um, resorption and the formation is basically what defines bone strength. If it goes towards the um, uh, resorption, you are at risk of fracture. Now, the drugs that we use today, the non-hormonal drugs, are basically, most of them are anti-resorptive drugs, and we have one uh, anabolic or formative drug available, which we'll discuss, and then on <coughs> the horizon, we may we have another one, which I'll also discuss. So here are the available drugs that you have to use, and the first question is always, which one works the best? which one reduces bone the most, that's the one that I want to use. Now, unfortunately, it's not that easy to do that um, because of the different um, populations which we used in the um, uh, defining studies to assess the fracture reduction. So uh, um, the, uh, the problem is, and if we have a look at the next slide, uh, we see that although it looks like the newer drugs have a better relative risk reduction. The truth of the matter is that they were all tested in a higher risk population. So the higher the risk of a, a, a fracture in your population, the better your results will look. So you can't compare these. And the other thing is that there are quite a few of other things looking at exactly how these results were given. So this is a, a, a table which comes from the IOF Compendium of Osteoporosis, which was published late last year. So if you have a look at how they look at the efficacy of the drugs, you see that they not only have a look at the effect on vertebral um, fracture or on non-vertebral fracture, but they have a look at whether it was actually tested in patients with osteoporosis, that's a T-score of minus 2.5 without a fracture, or with a fracture that's called established osteoporosis for both groups. And then you also have to have a look at <coughs> whether it was done as a primary anal analysis or whether it was as a subset of a group or a post hoc analysis. So it very, becomes really tricky in actually knowing which one is the best and which one to use in a patient. And I'd just like from this to show you, to have a look at the middle row uh, where Florence talked about hormone therapy. And hormone therapy is the only drug that ticks all the boxes <laughs> from the, the IOF. 
in virtually all of the other ones, you will find some a star that or showing that it was not done in patients without fractures or it was a subgroup analysis. I think that the two um, <coughs> most obvious ones here is if we have a look at the bisphosphonates and we have a look at, at um, the ibandronate, we see that there's a, a certain lack of primary analysis results on hip fractures, for instance, but I'll address that later when, <coughs> when we uh, get to the specific drugs. So the bisphosphonates still form the backbone of the therapy that you'll use. And so it is important that you know a couple of things about the bisphosphonates. These, the later ones, are the nitrogen-containing bisphosphonates. So how do they work? Well, firstly, they stick to bone um, very tightly, but they stick to bone in a <coughs> various degrees. Um, the second thing is that it actually works by in the inhib inhibition of the FPP synthase, thus blocking the prenylation of small GTBA signaling proteins. And these signaling proteins are essential for the cell function and survival of the osteoclast. So what these drugs do, they stick to bone, they are released over a period of time, and they actually de-energize the osteoclast. So you virtually kill off a certain proportion of the osteoclasts, and that's important to keep that in mind when we get to the major unwanted effects, because today the bisphosphonates are virtually defined by the potential or the perceived side effects that they have. And these side effects of the um, bisphosphonates are basically the osteonecrosis of the jaw, and <laughs> the bisphosphonate-related um, osteonecrosis of the jaw it is defined as an area of exposed bone in the maxillofacial region that does not heal within eight weeks after identification by a healthcare worker in a patient who was receiving or had been exposed to a bis bisphosphonate and had not received radiation therapy to the craniofacial region. Now, I just want to tell you that I see a lot of osteoporosis patients and I treat a lot of osteoporosis patients. In the dosages of bisphosphonates that we use in clinical practice, this is such a rare event that if you have one, I would please like to know about it because it just doesn't happen. It happens mostly, and I see the cases from coming from my oncological colleagues who use it for various oncological reasons at much higher dosages, and that's really where the problem lies. But Trying to convince the dentist about this is really very difficult. So you spend a lot of time on the phone about the dentist who wants to drill a, a hole or something in the tooth, but the patient's been on a bisphosphonate. Now they don't want to touch them, but they want to stop the drug for six weeks, and it's not going to help because the drug's still going to be around for a couple of years later. So this is not really a problem except if you're an oncologist, if, if you're dealing with other conditions such as Paget's or um, <coughs> myelomatosis. The other one, <coughs> the next one, the atypical femur fractures, uh, probably is a greater problem in the uh, practice. Now, <coughs> this is a fracture which occurs not in the hip, in the neck of the hip, but in the <coughs> subtracanteric, in other words, in the shaft of the femur. Now, <coughs> these um, uh, patients have characteristically um, the thickened cortices on the bone. It's a clean transverse fracture with beaking. And if it's not happened, if it's happened on the one side, it's probably going to happen on the other side. Now, <coughs> these um, atypical femur fractures, there's never been a direct relationship found between the anti-resorbent therapies and that, but there seems to be association with the length of time. But that could mean many things. So it could, for instance, mean that this is also a type of osteoporotic fracture that we just don't treat. And as we prevent the, the neck fractures, these are the ones that we see which we just previously didn't notice. But nobody actually quite knows. So it is important then to know that this association is associated with the length of treatment. The osteonecrosis of the jaw is mostly related to the dosage, and, but this is more related to the length. But so just to put this into perspective, 
if you have a look at the top, at the risk of the um, bisphos of, of the bisphosphonate-related osteonecrosis of the jaw, that's very small. So if you have a look here at the risk of hip fracture in the patient at high risk or at, in, at the immediate risk or at low risk, we see that if you're going to use any of these drugs, you have around about a 50% chance of preventing a femur fracture. So you're going to have a chance of reducing this amount of, of fracture in a patient at high risk according to that risk of, of the osteonecrosis of the jaw or that risk of the atypical femur fractures. So you will still be preventing far more classical um, hip fractures than you will be maybe causing atypical fractures. So just bear that in mind. So the other important aspect then in having a look at the utilization is how long do these drugs actually work? Now we don't, we haven't got a lot of data on this and most of this data comes from a single study, a lendronate study, where they treated the patients for five years and then half of the patients went off treatment, the other half continued treatment. And we see these patients that went off treatment, there was actually still a slight increase in bone density after five years. And it was only really after five years that an increased incidence of um, fractures started. But the amount of patients in these studies were really just too small to make a big conclusion. So what do we do in practice? Um, well, we have a... I'm, I'm just taking the typical guidelines of my own um, osteoporosis um, federation, which I must admit I wrote, and it's not nothing more than a thumb suck because there's no data to go on, but so my thumb suck is probably as good as anyone else's. So we say that following three to five years of therapy with a bisphosphonate, and depending on the agent used, we'll get to that now, we suggest that a drug holiday be considered in those who are not at high risk of fracture. But we don't know how long such a, fact, uh, such a holiday should be, and we don't really know how to follow and to monitor these patients. So one has to use a bit of discretion. But in patients who are still at high risk of fracture after the five years of treatment on the oral drugs or three years of treatment on the IV drug, um, you should consider to continue if you haven't got another drug to go on. Now, in Europe, we had in South Africa the recently strontium ranolate, which we often used under these circumstances. It's not available anymore, so your only other um, option is really to use something like denosumab um, <coughs> if you don't want to go to an anabolic drug, and I'll just now tell you why you can't always go on an anabolic drug. And But just remember that denosumab is also an antiresorbent therapy, so you would just be changing the strategy, but you won't be changing actually what's happening in bone. So let's just then have a quick look at the different bisphosphonates, and this is really going to have to be quickly. Um, alendronate, still the most popular drug and most widely used drug in osteoporosis fracture prevention. 70 milligrams every week per mouth has to be taken um, on an empty stomach with a glass of water and fasting for another hour after that, otherwise it doesn't work. Um, alendronate basically works vertebral and non-vertebral, and we have 10-year follow-up data on the drug. It's just important to know that your bone mineral density increases in the first three to five years, but after that it plateaus and you don't get any more effect. And the problem with the long-term therapy is that you probably uh, can suppress the osteoblast after a period of time, and that may account then for the osteonecrosis of the jaw and the AFF. So the second one is a resitronate. Now, the resitronate is mostly now given as 150 milligrams monthly per mouth. Um, it's efficient at the, at the spine and at the hip. There are very few cases of osteonecrosis of the jaw or AFF reported on resitronate, but it may just reflect the fact that it's not used as often or as common as a lendronate. But there seems to be... Uh, uh, we have seven-year data available of that, and um, because it's such a strong inhibitor of the FPP synthase, it has a very quick onset of action, but it has a low affinity for bone, which is good, because if you stop it, it's out of the system fairly quickly. 
So if you want to give a drag holiday on resedronate, it will have to be much shorter than on alendronate. So alendronic acid, this is the five milligram um, infusion as an IV drug. So um, it is an infusion that takes about um, 15 to 20 minutes to give. We can have an acute phase reaction which can be um, lessened a lot by giving a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory at the same time. Um, we have 10-year data um, on, on this drug. Um, the ONJ and AFF can also occur, but very rarely. And <coughs> so how do we deal with this then? At the present moment, the most authorities agree that you should give one injection yearly for three times and then have a drug holiday of three years. But again, there's not a lot of data actually backing that. And I know most of my friends will give one injection and then wait at least two to three years before the next one because this drug is probably much more potent and sticks to bone longer than we think. But that would be off-label. Um, um, <coughs> the other thing that's important is that we do have data that if a patient presents with a hip fracture and you give it in the in-hospital time, it does actually prevent the fracture at the other hip, which is also very important. Ibandronate, um, <coughs> the only problem with ibandronate, well, not the problem, is that in the original bone study, it was not effective at the hip. So they did not repeat the primary hip fracture study compared to placebo, but when they brought out the 150 milligram monthly, they doubled up on the dosage. And there's fairly good indirect after the fact evidence that it works as well as anything else on the hip in, in that, but it's if you wanna be puristic, um, you should not use it for a prevention of hip fractures. Follow-up data is five years, looking good. Safety profile is good. So again, if you want to do a drug holiday here, it's gotta be shorter than that for alendronate because it doesn't stick to bone as well. So now we move on to denosumab, DMAP, the rank ligand inhibitor. Our first speaker, Alicia, um, clearly show you how the osteoblast actually um, controls the rate of bone turnover by signaling to the osteoclast um, with the rank ligand um, system. Now, <clears throat> all that's happened here is that the company Amgen was very clever in that they knew if they could have an antibody to um, <coughs> the um, rank ligand, then they could inhibit the activation of the osteoclast. And that's exactly what's been done. It's a simple monoclonal antibody that binds to the, the um, <coughs> rank ligand, and in that way, the um, osteoclast function and survival um, is reduced. And this is just to show that they got 10 years data out on that now, and it's still looking very good after 10 years, and there's still incremental increases of bone density after 10 years. So <coughs> there you can see the summary. The most important thing about DMAP is that it is not secreted by the kidneys. So you can have a patient in kidney failure, which often happens, with uh, patients with osteoporosis, then this will be the drug of choice. There are various oncological indications. We now move on to the anabolic drugs, and you can see here that our anabolic drug, the intermittent PTH or teriparatide, does not only increase bone density, but it also, um, <coughs> it does not only increase the bone density, but it also repairs the microstructural damage um, that occurred to the bone. And this is given as a subcutaneous daily injection. That is the first problem with the drug is that you have to give it every day like a patient on insulin. But the most big, biggest problem with this is that the price is disproportionately out of the reach of many patients. And if the company who makes this drug just brought the price down by half, they would sell a thousand times more of the drug because it's an excellent drug but it is unfortunately inhibited by the very um, um, high price. So an area that is receiving a lot of attention is your um, uh, sequence between the anabolic drug and the anti-resorptant drug. And you have a window of opportunity with an anabolic drug. The first 18 months, you will have an increase in bone density via the osteoblast, but after 18 months, you lose that. So then you have to go onto an anti-resorptant drug, 
And it seems at the moment, um, <coughs> from the work of Felicia Kosman, that um, if a patient had been on alendronate or an and you then change over to an anabolic drug, you must also still continue for a while with the anabolic drug. So, but I think that's best left to the, the experts if you get into that. In. Now, the latest drug that we have is called a baloparatide, and this is a tweakening of the teriparatide, and because of the specific binding to the parathyroid hormone receptor, it was thought that it would have a superior action on bone. We have the active trial three, which is a placebo-controlled trial of uh, uh, baloparatide and teriparatide. And as you can see from here, bone mineral density was certainly uh, above placebo for both the anabolic drugs. And in fact, the baloparatide was slightly better. Um, but when we got to the fracture data, um, it was very impressive, but the baloparatide did not outperform teriparatide on the fracture data. Um, <coughs> what it did, though, there were fewer episodes of hypercalcemia, which is sometimes a problem with these. But the main thing about a baloparatide, it's cheaper than teriparatide, and um, <coughs> that's already been shown in the market. There's now an active extension study on bone mineral density, which also shows the extended effect of that. Now, there's a problem in the regulatory approval, although it was approved in the United States, the EMEA, the European authorities, have just turned it down uh, for reasons not quite clear, but um, they rejected the non-vertebral efficacy. As you can see, the, um, <coughs> the, the, uh, the line went onto one. It didn't cross it, but they said they are uh, not taking that as being statistically significant. But they sniffled into the data, and there were two of the clinical trial sites that they said didn't follow GPC, a GCP, and for that reason, um, the company has to submit again. So this time we have it that the Americans have approved it and Europeans don't, which is normally the converse that, that we have. So whether you're going to have the drug in, in Europe, I don't know. And just lastly... The only new drug in phase three development is a very interesting story. The drug is called Romozozumab, and that's an anti-sclerostin antibody. Um, I think you showed the pathway just now, I'll show that. And this is how observations, clinical observations, lead to drug discoveries. There was this condition of patients with very heavy and strong bones, and it was found that they had a deletion at the 17th chromosome, um, which caused them to be deficient of sclerostin. And that was then clinically followed up, and that led to um, close inspection of the WIMP uh, B cathenin signaling pathway. Now, on this pathway, WIMP will uh, uh, connect to the, or, or to the LRP5 and 6, and that will then cause the downstream um, transcription with stimulation of the osteoblast function. So the WIMP signaling pathway powers the osteoblast in making new bone, in other words, the anabolic action. So in nature itself, that pathway is blocked by sclerostin, which binds to the receptor, and then you don't get activation of the osteoblast. So the clinical um, um, challenge now was to find an antibody against the sclerostin. So if you can block sclerostin, then there would be increased activity of the osteoblast, and that's exactly what's been done. It's also an, a monoclonal antibody directed against sclerostin. In the phase two studies of bone density, it works superbly, as you can see, and a dose uh, and uh, response curve shows that the higher the dose, the higher the bone mineral density. And then there were two phase three studies of which I took part in the second one. And <coughs> in the first one, it was uh, placebo controlled. In other words, you had a group that, uh, that had um, um, treated for 12 months with the, the Romo, and the other ones had a placebo, and then they were both followed afterwards with denosumab. Now, <coughs> unfortunately, in this study, um, <coughs> what, what they found was that the um, new vertebral fractures, yes, it worked fantastic, but in terms of non-vertebral fracture, it didn't make the end point. 
Now, the exact reason for that is not known, but if they took out the data that came from a South American group, then it was, in fact, um, statistically significant. So there was probably a very low incidence of, of, of fractures in that particular group. But then the second study, the ARC study, which we were part of it, um, <coughs> which compared it to alendronate, showed that it worked very well compared to alendronate. It reduced the new vertebral fractures by 48% compared to alendronate. So it did all the right things. So in this study, all the efficacy endpoints were met. But um, <coughs> then as far as the safety concerned, which was no problem in any of the other studies, there was suddenly an increased risk of cardiovascular disease found. Now, this is very difficult to explain. Um, is this now <coughs> because of the fact that maybe the alendronate reduces the risk of, of cardiovascular disease, or does Romo do it? So this is now being looked at further, and um, all the cases of cardiovascular disease has, has been re-adjudicated by the Timmy group, and I think two weeks ago we had the closeout on that, so we're waiting to see what the new results of that would be. So this is really, as far as I am concerned, I really hope that we get this drug. It's the only really new one that we get. It's an, uh, it's an anabolic, and um, <coughs> uh, uh, it's, it, I think, really a superb drug. So um, what about the future after this? Well, there's nothing at the moment in phase two studies, but just look at all the ways in which cell <laughs> can control. So there are plenty of other areas in which we can look at. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, dear chairman, dear colleagues, I would like to thank the organizing committee for the possibility to present our research, and I dedicate my talk to the memory of Professor Vera Smetnik. Uh, I have no financial uh, relationships to disclose. Uh, through the several past years, there has been more emerging evidence that bone, uh, like adipose tissue, can act as an endocrine organ. Uh, until recently, bone was regarded like um, an endocrine non-active tissue, like a target for hormones. Uh, however, osteoblasts and osteocytes uh, can uh, uh, regulate uh, phosphate and energy homeostasis uh, through the uh, uh, religion into the circulation of the fibroblast growth factor, the 23rd, and osteocalcin. Um, osteocytes are postnatally the uh, main source of sclerostin and rankle to regulate the osteoblastogenesis and osteoclastogenesis, respectively. Uh, osteoblasts and adipocytes originate from the common progenitor, mesenchymal stem cell, and the balance of their differentiation is determined by several common factors, including wind beta catenin and PPAR gamma pathways, as well as uh, uh, estrogens, leptin, and sclerostin. Uh, Leptin, uh, secreted by extramedullary adipocytes, can regulate the bone metabolism indirectly through, this, um, through the modulation of the central sympathetic nervous system. Osteocalcin, known as a marker of uh, bone formation, uh, however, uh, the uncarboxylated osteocalcin released into the circulation can enhance the pancreatic insulin production and influence the lipid metabolism. Uh, the aim of our study was to work out an all-instrumental screening for low bone mineral density in women with estrogen deficit based on clinical, biochemical, and molecular genetic markers of bone and lipid metabolism. Uh, the main group of our study consisted on 109 women with uh, secondary amenorrhea with at least six months without HRT, uh, 55 uh, women with primary ovarian insufficiency and 54 with uh, secondary hypothalamic amenorrhea. Uh, the mean duration of amenorrhea was five years. And the comparison group uh, comprised 191 women uh, with uh, postmenopausal women, uh, 100 120 with postmenopausal osteoporosis, 71 with normal bone mineral density, without menopausal hormonal therapy, and without metabolic syndrome. 
we conducted a cross-sectional study with the evaluation of main biochemical tests, as well as DXA, BMI, and evaluation of levels of sclerostin, osteoprotegerin, and rancal biolyzer, and molecular genetic markers by PCR, uh, known to regulate bone and fat metabolism. Um, uh, bone mineral density uh, was defined by Z score uh, according to the ISCD's official position. Z score uh, equal or below minus two was used to define low bone mineral density in women with secondary amenorrhea. And we found low bone mineral density in 23.6% women with primary ovarian insufficiency and 48.2% of women with secondary hypothalamic amenorrhea. 5.6% percent of them also had low bone mineral density in femoral neck in addition to lumbar spine. Uh, in group of women with secondary amenorrhea and low bone mineral density, the onset of amenorrhea was notably earlier and the duration was notably longer than in those with normal bone mineral density. The atherogenic coefficient was significantly higher in women with low bone mineral density. And overall, there was a positive correlation between bone mineral density in lumbar spine and body mass index in women with secondary amenorrhea and in postmenopausal women. Um, Binary logistic regression analysis uh, revealed some factors that are associated with bo low bone mineral density in women with secondary amenorrhea, such as duration of amenorrhea, body mass index, and the atherogenic coefficient that made up uh, a screening method um, for low bone mineral density in women with secondary amenorrhea, we patented it, and we think that uh, the women uh, from the high risk group should uh, undergo a DXA. Uh, also, we found uh, the threshold for uh, osteoprotegerin and rank to osteoprotegerin ratio as a diagnostic marker of low bone mineral density in women with secondary amenorrhea. Uh, also, uh, we found that certain uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms of genes coding leptin receptor, collagen type 1, uh, vitamin D receptor, and sclerostin are main molecular genetic markers for low bone mineral density risk assessment in women with secondary amenorrhea and uh, ESNPs of rancal, osteoprotegerin, vitamin D, estrogen receptor alpha, and leptin are the main molecular genetic markers for postmenopausal osteoporosis. Uh, also, we found a significant influence of leptin receptor polymorphism on uh, bone mineral density in women, uh, uh, in underweight women with hypothalamic amenorrhea and postmenopausal women with obesity, contrary to normal weight group. Also, we found um, a significant influence of gene coding sclerostin that is secreted by osteocytes um, on uh, body mass index in women with postmenopausal osteoporosis, contrary to those with normal bone mineral density. Uh, via the logistic regression analysis, we found that uh, among the genetic markers, the maximum relative impact uh, had uh, the polymorphism of leptin receptor on body mass index in women with amenorrhea and uh, in women uh, with, uh, in postmenopausal women, as well as uh, the polymorphism of leptin receptor uh, had the maximum relative impact uh, on the bone mineral density in postmenopausal women. Uh, also, uh, we uh, found uh, that these genetic mar markers with body mass uh, can um, comprise a, a screening or even predictive uh, formula for uh, postmenopausal osteoporosis, and we consider that the high-risk group uh, have, uh, has the indication for DXA and the indication for menopausal hormonal therapy as prevention of osteoporosis. Uh, I would like to conclude that we found certain associations of bone and fat in women with estrogen deficit of uh, different age uh, with the key role of leptin receptor uh, that uh, led us to new screening and predictive uh, approaches. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.